So let's talk about the forces of the greater good in Warhammer 40k, which Tau units are looking strongest and weakest on the tabletop right now. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, where today we're talking Tau, and in this video I thought we'd do a big tier list overview of all the units in the index, talking through the strongest and the weakest, and why I'd rank them where I would. Tau and Warhammer 40k are perhaps off to a bit of a shaky start in 10th edition, probably one of the indexes that is struggling a little bit more than most, though a few lists do seem to have still put in some good performances at grand tournaments with some high placings, though are certainly on a bit of a back foot compared with the very strongest armies in the game. Still though, they can still bring some pretty heavy firepower, and certainly from turn 3 plus when Cao Yong gets active, a lot of their units get very very scary indeed, though I perhaps still think that they're a slightly higher skill army to use than some of them given that you kind of need to trade off a bit between pushing forward onto midfield objectives and getting lines of sight, versus staying back out of harm's reach and playing a bit cagey until turn 3 comes and you get a lot more damage output. In any case, for this video I thought we'd do a rough tier ranking of just very roughly how the different units are shaping up in terms of in-game power, this one partially based on a community poll, partly on some of my own opinions, and we'll go through each one of the Tau units in turn and talk about where they stack up against their peers. We'll talk through each unit in turn, ranked into five different tiers for the army, a very rough appraisal of their current strength, and why I've chosen to rank them where they are. Obviously tier lists are always a little bit arbitrary, some things could have been ranked a bit higher or lower, and it depends on the army and the context as well. If you think that anything is a little bit undervalued or overvalued here, feel free to let me know down in the comments. In any case though, let's jump straight into it. We'll start off with the lower ranked units, and tier 5 I've just chosen to rank just the single unit in tactical drones, seemingly a unit that Games Workshop don't really want you to play too much at the moment. I guess quite a lot of the flavour of the new Tau Index is that they're trying to de-emphasise drones a bit, and not have them tanking damage for all sorts of units in basically every single unit in your army, more being treated like war gear, but it certainly seems that the unit that you can field of them on their own with the tactical drone squad are basically just pointed to an extent where you probably never really want to take them. They're 70 points, 140 or 210 for 4, 8 or 12, i say roughly double the cost that you kind of hope for them given their damage and defence, they're easier to kill with toughness 3 now, pretty terrible damage output with their ballistic skill 5 plus carbines, and they don't even have the for the greater good rule so they can't help a spot for things, and the only real things that they have going for them are that they have deep strike and a reasonable ish move characteristic, perhaps if they were actually pointed for their damage profile they'd be kind of useful for just random chaff units to deep strike and do secondary objectives and things, even if they don't kill very much, but at these crazy overcosted points values I can't really see very many people taking them, not when you could have best bid if you want a cheap deep striking unit that can actually deal some damage. Next up we've got tier 4, units that I'd consider are pretty weak in the context of the Tau Codex, again pretty unlikely to make up any significant part of competitive lists. Starting out we've got the Sunshark Bomber for 150 points, Flies in 10th edition have their issues, and I feel like this one perhaps has more issues than most of them, given that a fair bit of its value actually comes from its pulse bombs, and they're just very very hard to use in 10th. It doesn't turn up till turn 2 unless you waste command points on rapid ingress, and then even when it gets there, it's got a locked flight path, which means that opponents could just move out the way of the bombs, just making them super hard to use meaningfully compared with how it was back in 9th. It does have a bit of shooting, with those ion rifles from the drones, plus some seeker missiles and missile pods, but it seems that if you actually want a tower fly, you might well be better off with one of the others. Next up, we've got the Riptide variants, the Ravana and the Avara. These two cost the same as the Codex Riptide, have a slightly tweaked defensive profile with one more wound and one more pip of toughness, but a worse invulnerable save, which probably makes them less tough overall against quite a lot of things. I feel like these guys are perhaps in the same sort of weight class as the Riptide, and are maybe somewhat balanced in terms of damage output against that, though that's not really a good thing. The Ravana kicks out an average of around 11 attacks at strength 8, AP 1 and damage 2, not awful but not standout, and the Ivara is perhaps a bit more of a mixed threat, 4 or 5 shots with strength 8, AP 2 and damage 3, plus a 10 attack flamer with strength 6, AP 1 and damage 1. For those profiles I don't think either of them are really all that exciting to be honest, I feel like they struggle for damage output perhaps even more than the Riptide, and not having a 4 plus invulnerable save does kind of hurt a bit. Like the Riptide they do have a couple of fun moves though, the Ivara can move very fast one turn, and the Ravana can be a bit more tanky against a turn of high strength damage for one turn, though I still think that they're both kind of unlikely to be battle line units that are used all that regularly. Next up, and kind of hard to rank on a tier list really, is the Manta. It's not really going to be a competitive model at 2100 points, it's basically a fun model for more casual big games on an enormous table. 
I guess realistically, if you're trying to make any sort of competitive list, you're probably not going to be taking this. It doesn't really have enough damage output for its immense points cost, and even if it can transport everything, there's maybe only so much limited value in doing so, when you could basically have an entire extra tower army on the table for the cost of this thing. Maybe it should have been in tier 5 really, but I feel like it's just a bit kind of hard to rank, given that it's not really intended for any sort of more competitive tower list in the first place. Otherwise here, I've also ranked a couple of the slightly more underwhelming crew units in my opinion. The Fast Orcas are 105 points. These guys are an infiltrating crew team that I think pay a little bit over the odds for a couple of special weapons, ignores cover and the infiltrate special rule. They do also get a small damage boost against one unit that they're trying to hunt, but I don't think it's enough to actually make them that much of a threat to most enemy units. So just paying extra points for them seems like a bad idea compared with the standard crew in my opinion. They're still very easy to kill for the points, which doesn't really do them any favours at this kind of points cost. Otherwise, I think a hard sell for Crute units is the Crute Shaper at 50 points. It was a lot more playable when he was just 25 points and nice and cheap before. Now in terms of buffs for the unit, he just gives a 6 plus feel no pain type save, though it still doesn't make the unit exactly tanky. And it's a bit disappointing that he doesn't really add any notable melee of his own. He only hits with a few attacks at AP0, which just isn't really worth the include, even if he does get a once per game buff to it. In general, the Crute units I think just want to be cheap interference, so buying them buffing characters sort of goes against their entire purpose. Finally, even if you did, I feel like you'd probably want to go for Ornshi over the Crute Shaper. Next up, we've got the Tidewall Fortifications. These things are between 85 and 90 points each, and essentially very slow moving transports for Fire Warriors to shoot from and get an objective control of zero. I think out of the units here, I'd be actually more tempted to put these guys up towards tier 3 out of any of them. They're not too bad value for their defensive profile, and they all do at least something interesting, either shooting every unit within a certain range, a 5 plus invulnerable save, or a very big and scary but very inaccurate railgun. At least in theory maybe it isn't the worst to have a strike team floating up the board on, but I think that they just compare very poorly to the devilfish, they don't move very fast at only 4 inches, and even if you do manage to get to an objective, their objective control zero, so unless the fire warriors get out, then he's still not taking that objective with this unit at least. Moving on we get to the tier 3 units, I feel like these are a bit less standout bad, though perhaps a little bit overshadowed within the context of the codex. Not too bad to do a certain battlefield role, though maybe going to be outcompeted just by taking other options in more competitive lists most of the time. First up we have the Riptide, as mentioned he's got a little bit less wounds and toughness compared with the Forge World versions, though does get his nice 4 plus invulnerable save from that shield generator. I'd probably be more tempted by his Ion Accelerator, a bunch of damage 4 shots are quite nice, though it is kind of sad that he's only strength 8 these days, definitely makes him a lot less threatening against enemy monsters and vehicles compared with how he used to be. Otherwise he gets a once per game devastating wounds, a secondary weapon system, maybe some twin linked fusion blasters. I still feel like the other bigger suits are likely to be taken a bit more than the Riptide though. I feel like broadsides and crisis suits are more likely to be your primary damage dealers than this guy. Next up we've got the Fire Warrior Strike Team. These guys I think are ranked towards the top of tier 3. Maybe one or two units in an army, though I certainly wouldn't go too mad with them. I feel like Breacher Teams and Devilfish will be a fair bit more popular. Probably the biggest thing holding them back is their damage output. No AP on the Pulse Rifles anymore, and kind of need to get up close to be good damage output, at which point you might well have wanted to take Breachers anyway, as they actually get seriously scary up close. I still say that they're fairly expensive for the defence, at 100 points for a unit of 10 of them. They do get a Guardian Drone built in though for a minus 1 to wound, which does help. I'd say that maybe the single best use case for these guys is perhaps an Escort for an Ethereal. He can give them a 5 plus feel no pain to actually make them some fairly durable backfield objective holders perhaps, plus do a little bit of command point farming on a 4 plus each turn. I feel like between 150 points from the strike team plus the ethereal, you've probably got overall good value there, though I might argue it's the ethereal that's carrying the weight of the value compared with the units. Next up I've chosen to rank the other tower flyers here. Maybe I'm actually being a little bit harsh to the Tiger Shark here, that perhaps could have been more up towards tier 2. Again in 40k though, flies definitely have big disadvantages that don't have a hover mode, having to start off the board turn 1 so you can't get any sort of alpha strike on the go with them, turn up turn 2 from strategic reserve, and from there they get a lot less flexible movement than most units having to choose their flight path the previous turn. Still though, some of these damage outputs really aren't too bad, the Tiger Shark in particular I think is quite nice, with basically two hammerheads worth of firepower, plus a few extra small arms as well. Perhaps not too bad defence as well with 18 wounds and a 5 plus invulnerable save. If you upgrade to the AX one then you can get a damage 12 railgun and some psychic ion blasters if you prefer, though I think that perhaps the basic one is the one with better value, that just seems very very all or nothing. 
Otherwise, the Barracuda drops 50 points, but loses one of its primary armaments, I'd say maybe a little bit less value than the Tiger Shark overall. And then there's the Codex Fly, the Razor Shark for 165 points, I'd say that's probably better than the Sun Shark overall. Slightly better damage output with its guns, and also a plus one to hit against fly units, which could be kind of big. I feel like these could be okay, just as an extra threat coming in from reserve, so you probably wouldn't want to go too heavy on the flyers to make sure that you've got at least some threats on the board early on. They're not exactly going to be helping out with objectives very much either. Next up, we've got some fast interference from Remora Stealth Drones, two of these for 160 points. These guys definitely pay a premium for what they do, they don't really do absolutely tons of damage and defence, even if they do come loaded with a couple of Seeker missiles each and a burst cannon. But they do seem kind of interesting as they've got the Infiltrator special rule to start in the midfield, plus a massive movement with 16 inches and fly. So it could be good for nipping around the board doing secondary objectives and things. And they even have a slightly disruptive 6 inch reactive move to if the enemy gets too close, so they might be hard to charge. I feel like between forward deploy and the massive movements they've probably got at least some value. I feel like they do have some downsides compared with the other very good Tetras and Piranhas though, both of which are pretty excellent fast skimmers, and they're far far tougher than these drones even with stealth. Next up we've got the Crew units, which I feel like are possibly usable in small numbers for a small amount of scouting models and disruptive threats to the enemy, but they definitely have pretty underwhelming profiles compared with previous editions, and I probably wouldn't go particularly heavy on them. I think I'd rank them towards the lower end of this tier, maybe towards tier 4. For the options you've either got the standard carnivores, 75 point light infantry skirmishers, which can be okay against enemy light infantry if they go one on one. Stealth keeps them a little bit more safe than they might have been otherwise, and they can gain a feel no pain if they kill a foe in melee. They've got the most objective control points out of these as well, which could be handy for skirmishing on mid board objectives. Otherwise, I feel like a tiny unit of crude hounds or two could be useful enough, just 30 points for four annoying models that the opponent doesn't really want to have to think about dealing with too much. They scout quite fast and move quite quickly, so they could potentially do some annoying nuisance charges or first turn move blocking maybe, and hopefully pin some of the opponent in their deployment zone. Tiny units can be handy enough for some secondary objectives as well, even if they're not really going to do much on primaries with the OC0. Finally, Crutox Rider, and maybe being a bit generous by ranking in tier 3 versus tier 4, He's 35 points, I feel like you might have some argument for him being both very cheap like the hounds, but also with a little bit of damage output and a little bit of objective control, though in reality I feel like the speed of the hounds is going to usually outcompete him, at least for a lot of people's lists. Again though it doesn't really seem to have the worst just to have one or two lumbering towards midfield objectives, even if they're not going to do too much in terms of damage or defence, perhaps just more annoying units to hide out of line of sight and force the opponents to have to try and deal with. Next up, for 60 points we have Orn-Shi. The close combat ethereal gives you plus one objective control to one of your squads, plus a little bit of melee threat. I'd say that probably the best use of them is to perhaps make crew carnivores a little bit more dangerous. Adding a little bit more general purpose melee could actually help them punch off a little bit against medium infantry like space marines, as opposed to just literally light infantry. Plus the extra objective control is kind of handy going up to OC2. Perhaps just doesn't really seem like an amazing fit for things like breaches or strike teams though, as Orn-Chi wants to be in combat, but they really don't want to be. Otherwise, we've also got Dark Strider here as well. 75 points, and probably a little bit expensive for what he does now, I think. He denies reserves at 12 inches from just his model alone, which is handy enough to park on an objective with some Pathfinders, and he also gives his Pathfinder squads a plus one to wound when they target a unit. I feel like for 75 points, though, that's just a little bit borderline, as he doesn't really do too much damage output himself, now his Pulse Carbine's AP0. For this kind of points cost, I sort of feel like you might be just better off just getting in more Pathfinders if you can afford some, and putting his points towards another unit rather than just giving one slightly better shooting. Moving onwards and upwards though, here we have Tier 2, solidly usable Tau units in my opinion. I could happily see the vast majority of these being used in some sort of competitive list, though probably aren't quite as standout as the ones that are ranked in Tier 1. First off, and perhaps one of the better contenders for being ranked in Tier 1 might be the Vespid Stingwings, 75 points for a disruptive unit of 5 of them, fast moving infantry units that like to be up close are kind of handy for doing tactical objectives and moving round the board, and these guys also have one of those rules where they get to jump on and off the board to help with objectives later if needed. The damage output is also solid enough against space marine equivalents, 2 shots with strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2, though unfortunately they don't have 4 the greater good, so they'll only ever be hitting on 4+. plus. In general I'd say they're solidly usable. Nice and fast, but still not probably carrying the mainstay of the damage against most units. Next, we've got the Fireside Marksman team. These guys are lone operatives and do a very small amount of sniper damage. 
I wouldn't say that the actual sniper drones are the main reason to take the unit though. They've got lone operatives so they're hard to kill. You could park them on a home field objective or a far flung midfield one perhaps. And then can just function as annoying snipers and spotters for the rest of the game. Making your other tower units hit on a 3 plus rather than a 4. Pretty easy to kill if the opponent can ever catch up with them. But fill that between their small sniper shots plus the spotter ability. There's probably enough reason to include perhaps one of these in an army. You could even set them up towards the top of a ruin to get some plunging fire on the sniper drone shots. Next up we've got the Pathfinders for 120 points. These guys actually have genuinely very strong damage output with their ion or rail rifles. I feel like if you're looking for a backfield tower unit that can actually put out some serious firepower, the Pathfinders might serve you better compared with a strike team perhaps. They're definitely a unit with a fair amount of options in game. They can potentially scout forward if that makes sense, or infiltrate if you take their drone. Plus they do help out with spotting for units as well. They can spot for two different units with their marker light abilities. I'd say perhaps the biggest downside is that again that they're really quite easy to kill, and they can't escort an ethereal unlike the fire warrior strike team. And they would have some serious competition for spacing their devilfish with the breaches, with their big rerolls against units on objectives. Still though, I think they're pretty usable, even if they're fairly fragile. Next up we've got the Tau Tanks, the Skyray Missile Defense Gunship at 160, a Hammerhead Gunship at 145, and Long Strike at 170. I say that these three are at least fairly well balanced now. Perhaps even the Skyray might be slightly outcompeting the Hammerheads. Their primary weapon is three attacks at Strength 14, AP3, and Damage D6 plus one, and getting to reroll all hits versus flyer units plus a wound reroll. Definitely meaning that if there's any enemy flyer units that it can target, then they're ridiculously efficient against them. Full hit rerolls is really nice with Kalyon as well. You could potentially fish for some exploding sixes, and there are marker light units if you need to guide something big. Otherwise, the hammerhead tanks I think are a little bit more debatable between the railgun or the ion cannon now. At least now the railgun doesn't ignore the invulnerable saves anymore. They get a plus one to hit against monsters and vehicles, which reduces the need for guiding them. That plus the railgun heavy keyword as well. But you could have them hitting on twos if they are guiders. They also get a couple of seeker missiles, so they have a bit better alpha strike compared with the sky ray potentially. And they'd probably be most tempted by the Accelerator Burst Cannon Fire, a little bit more anti-infantry with Strength 6 up close. Finally, I feel like if you're going heavy on the tower tanks, Long Strike seems pretty reasonable. He's 25 points as an upgrade for the Hammerhead and pretty much does the exact same things, but he gets Ballistic Skill 3 plus and giving one other Hammerhead within 12 inches lethal hits each turn. Between the two of those, I think that's well worth the 25 point upgrade. Still maybe not enormously standout damage and defense for their cost though. I feel like perhaps the tower tanks are going to be a little bit overshadowed by some of the suits like the broadsides and the crisis battle suits for the mainline damage dealers for the army. Next up, I've also chosen to rank the Titanic Tower units here, the Storm Surge and the Taunar Supremacy armor. I feel like compared with the rest of the ones here in tier 2 though, these guys are probably towards the bottom end of it, maybe upper tier 3. They do have some big advantages, but Games Workshop did just give them a big bump of points, which they didn't really necessarily need in my opinion. Despite that though, having a towering keyword is quite powerful, particularly on certain tables that might have ruins with windows in, might mean that your opponent might just really struggle to hide from them on certain boards, and both of them have genuinely quite big scary powerful firepower. For 465 points the Storm Surge gets its enormous anti-tank damage 12 gun if it's firing at close range, and then more bonuses if it can either afford to be static or target enemy Titanic models. They're at least fairly tanky with 20 wounds, toughness 11, a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. A bit easier to wound with things like las cannons, but at least always get good saves against them. The Supremacy armor is really quite expensive at 790 points, comes with 30 wounds, toughness 13, a 2 plus save with a 5 plus invulnerable. And this thing just has all around powerful generalist firepower. A whole ton of damage 3 shots with those ion cannons that you could swap out for some powerful melter weapons. I think for the top gun I'd perhaps be most tempted by the enormous damage 16 railgun. That one does come with some anti-infantry shots built in as well. Definitely not a model that the opponent can afford to ignore. But it would need to do a serious amount of work to justify itself all the way up at almost 800 points. And I think with the defensive profile it has it's going to get killed a bit easier against some armies than you'd really like it to. Next up we've got some Tau Commanders with the Crisis Commander and the Enforcer Commander. The Crisis one is 110 points and the Enforcer is 135. Both of these seem reasonable enough to head up a Crisis Battlesuit unit, maybe taking that enhancement where he gets the Kaoyon benefits one turn early. That would be really quite nice for loads of spammed firepower. In general for the most part I've seen Crisis Commanders taking a lot of Psychic Ion Blasters. Hitting on threes is quite nice with those, though you could tailor to other roles with any of the other battlesuit weapons. Then in the unit you can either have reroll ones to hit for them with the standard crisis suit, 
or minus one AP to enemy weapons targeting the unit with the Enforcer, which isn't too bad given that lots of things in 10th edition can get cover saves quite easily, that'd be a good way of doubling down. I think given the points disparity, I slightly prefer the Crisis Commander over the Enforcer for the reroll ones to hit, though neither of them would still probably be my first choice over the Cold Star Commander that we'll get to in a second. Next up we have the very very weird unit that is Ornvar. In general I feel like he's a bit of an underrated unit within the Tau Codex. First up to take a look at him, he doesn't really do much in terms of leadership nor in terms of damage, but I feel like he's kind of just a Tau speed bump unit that's pretty much disguised as a commander. His loyalty leadership buff gives you an aura of plus one leadership, which I think is whatever. It might occasionally prevent a battle shock, though isn't really particularly reliable at doing so. His combat just really isn't all that much to justify him. Only six attacks uh, total at strength five, AP zero, and damage one. Could kill a light infantry or two. But they're just weirdly tanky and hard to kill. A four plus invulnerable save with minus one to hit and minus one to wound. And then just one turn where they get a turn of two plus invulnerable saves. Pretty much guaranteeing that they can be a massive speed bump for an enemy unit and hold up most things in the game for at least one turn particularly with 9 wounds in total, and spread across 3 different models to give your opponent a bit of overkill. I feel like Tau Empire can have a whole load of lone operatives on the board if they want to, between this guy, the Ghost Kills, Shadow Sun, and the Firesight teams, and between all that can put together an army that's surprisingly annoying to remove from the table, particularly as they don't really want to be wasting shots on Ornvar when there's more dangerous things to kill. I think in reality, without that much damage or leadership buffs, he still might be a bit of a questionable choice to put into most competitive lists, but I think could just be a kind of irritating unit for opponents to see on the other side of the table, perhaps defending a midfield objective and just being an annoying thing to take down. Otherwise here we've got the Ethereal, 50 points for a 5 plus fill no pain to either strikes or breacher teams, plus a chance to farm a command point each turn. I think between that that's really quite good value for 50 points, a nice defensive buff plus some extra command points that you might not get otherwise. I think he's really quite efficient in his own right, the command points plus the fill no pain look like they justify his cost. Might just be a little bit more exciting though if strike squads were a touch more exciting, or maybe if he could join Pathfinders with their fairly scary damage output. Putting him in a breacher unit seems a bit more questionable though, he can't use the command point farming thing when he's in a transport, and he might well not be living all that long on the front line once they're exposed. Finally for this tier we've got Commander Farsight at 120 points. A melee crisis commander who can get stuck in, in combat a little bit, as well as help out at range. Perhaps melee isn't the worst thing for the crisis teams in the whole world now, not now they can fire out of combat if they're stuck there. He's perhaps got one of the more powerful damage boosting buffs, giving you a plus one to wound with your unit when you're within nine inches, but it's kind of hard to get to that sort of range with crisis suits. You can't just deep strike into it, and you might not necessarily have the movement to get there. I feel like perhaps Farsight's a unit that could really work quite well with rapid ingress with a big block of crisis suits. Come down in the enemy turn somewhere safe, and then you can move forward to get into that scary threat range, and maybe follow up with a charge if you fancy it. When he gets there, he can hit particularly hard for one turn at least. You could use Tank Shock for him for an average of around about four mortal wounds. Plus he's got a once per game ability to activate some big rerolls in combat, and hopefully take down something important. Overall I think he's definitely usable for 120 points, maybe kind of similar value to the far more shooty commanders with rerolls and things. And bear in mind that you are trading him off against the opportunity to take Ethereals if that's an issue, though I wouldn't say that they're absolutely auto-include, as we've already mentioned. Finally though, getting on to tier 1 units, these are some of the units and characters that I most expect to be making up the mainstay of a lot of Tau Empire armies at the moment, some of the strongest models and options that you can put on the table. First up we've got Ghost Kills at 170 points, they're really quite an interesting unit being a big vehicle with some guns and getting lone operative, it means they can just completely stand in the open and lay some firepower into the enemy, maybe even try and nose onto midfield objectives with their infiltrate, and could be another option for spotting for other heavier damage dealing units. They've also got stealth to protect them from close range shooting, and then two drones to absorb damage once per game, and it all adds up to them being very tanky. I'd probably be most tempted by the Ion Raker and the Fusion Blasters, quite nice general purpose firepower there, though still not really all that good in terms of actual damage output compared with other units, you do pay a bit of a premium for hiding in plain sight. Overall I'd say that the ghost kills are pretty usable, perhaps one or two of them to be annoying skirmishers and add to the volume of fire. Next up, and still seeming to be an absolute mainstay unit in the Tau army, are the Tau Crisis Battlesuits, 195 points for three of them, 390 for six, and perhaps one of the more stock loadouts that a lot of people seem to be running are shield drones for extra wounds, shield generators for a four plus invulnerable save, and cyclic ion blasters for a whole load of spam strength 8, AP2 and damage 2 shots, even if you have to risk some hazardous checks for that. 
The Ion Blasters do just seem to be a lot more threatening than the vast majority of other guns that they can carry, though I think you could make an argument for literally any of the rest of them, depending on exactly what you want out of the squad. They've got some solid enough commander options to lead them, uh, between the Cold Star, the regular commanders, or Farsight, and you could certainly have that enhancement on the go to get them early Cao Yon, and they're perhaps the unit that you'd want to use that jump shoot jump stratagem on, so jump them out, shoot a whole bunch of enemy units to death, then hide behind some nearby terrain if possible. If they do get caught in combat as well, it's perhaps a little bit less of a deal than it used to be, as vehicles they can still fire out of melee, or just fire into melee with a whole load of big guns never tire shots. They perhaps do feel a bit less tanky than they used to be though, now they don't have a whole load of drones carrying ablative wounds for them. Next up, and perhaps some other better battle line damage dealers, are the broadside battle suits. 110 points for each of them, and you get them in squads of 1-3. to three. These guys perhaps seem like some of the most efficient mainline damage dealers with big rail rifles, can certainly take some chunks out of tanks. The heavy rail rifles get you two attacks at strength 12, AP4 and damage D6 plus 1, plus heavy and devastating wounds for some extra damage boosts there. Then I think you'd want to combine it with some combination of a Seeker missile, ignores modifiers, and one of their weapon systems, all of which I think are pretty solid choices, maybe with some missile drones for a few more random missile shots going in, or you could use some shield drones for more wounds. I think for their cost, their durability isn't terrible. Eight wounds at toughness six with a two plus save, and it's fairly easy to get cover in 10th edition. You should get some fairly high saves against most enemy shooting, Plus they even have their weird 4 plus feel no pain type ability against mortal wounds as well, and I guess that could help against some devastating wounds things. Moving on, we've got aggressive fire warriors to storm the midfield objectives with a breacher team in Devilfish. These guys get strong close range damage output with a whole bunch of spam strength 6 AP-1 attacks with re-rolling wound rolls against units on objectives. Quite a lot of firepower, a fair few objective control points, and they can get there really quite quickly with the Devilfish to move them up and catapult them out with the new transport rules. You could even potentially advance the Devilfish if it made the difference between getting them there or not. The Guardian Drone makes them a little bit tankier, the same with the regular Fire Warriors, and they could potentially even take a card of Fire Blades to lead the unit into battle as well. That would get you three attacks with each one of those Strength 6 AP-1 shots rather than just two. For its own right, the Devilfish is fairly sturdy with its defensive profile, comes with a burst cannon and probably some Seeker missiles as a backup support system, and perhaps most threateningly, a couple of Seeker missiles to fire off in the early game, a bit of an alpha strike against enemy armour. Once it gets onto objectives as well, if it makes sense to, you could use its combat embarkation stratagem to jump the nearby infantry back into it if they get threatened by a charge. I guess a lot of the time you wouldn't necessarily want to be abandoning the objective unless you absolutely have to, but if it makes the difference between the unit just getting charged and killed in one turn, or having another chance to get another round of firepower off, then that would be really quite nice. I think they're still maybe a little bit fragile for frontline objective holders, particularly at 115 points, but they can certainly bring the damage on the alpha strike. Next up, for some cheap skirmishers to hold down the midboard early, the stealth suits might be one of the better choices there. 75 points for a unit of 3 of them, or 150 for 6, I'd probably take them in the small unit size. These guys can start in the midfield, hopefully hidden somewhere out of line of sight, and unlike the bigger battle suits, get the infantry keyword for better interaction with terrain than most. These guys are better spotters than most things in the army, as, as well as just getting the regular benefits of spotting for a unit and also having a marker drone that you can throw into the squad. The unit that is being spotted for also gets to re-roll wound rolls of one against the target, and that could be quite a big deal if, say, you were spotting for an enormous unit of crisis suits, or perhaps a unit of broadsides. I think their homing beacon is potentially interesting as well. You could use that for a 0 CP rapid ingress stratagem once per game. Definitely something that could be interesting enough with certain crisis suit loadouts, perhaps particularly with Farsight. Maybe a little bit more on the situational side though, as it kind of depends just how close the enemy is getting to the stealth teams, and whether arriving crisis suits next to them is really the best position for them, as opposed to putting them somewhere else a bit more safely hidden perhaps. Next up, and perhaps one of the most standout gems from the Forge World Imperial armour, are the Tetras. It is kind of surprising that just how often these guys with just dedicated marker light support wind up being some of the more efficient units in the Tau Codex, not having to pay for other guns. For two of them it's 80 points, and for four of them it's 160, perhaps surprisingly cheap for the amount of durability that they have. 80 points for 14 wounds at toughness 7 with a 4 plus save, and going very quickly is kind of surprising really, even if obviously they're not going to be adding to any sort of damage output there. Interestingly, these guys get infiltrators, so you could start them really quite far up the board, and at just 80 points, they seem like they could be an interesting unit just for move blocking the enemy and stopping them leaving their deployment zone. 
I can imagine some big vehicle armies really not liking that if you just park a couple of Tetras across their movement lanes in the first turn. They could do some pretty annoying nuisance charges as well potentially. Otherwise though, if they're actually used for their intended purpose of supporting other unit shooting, they're perhaps one of the better synergy pieces in the entire Tau Codex now. They grant re-roll hits versus the spotted units, so that means that a lot of Tau units are going to be hitting just remarkably accurately, say hitting on a 3+, plus due to the spotter buff with the marker light, ignoring cover and re-rolling all hits against the target. Very nice indeed for things like broadsides or crisis. Again, seems extra nasty when the unit's in Kalyon as well, doubling down on sustained hits goodness. Next up are some scout skimmers with some actual damage output. The piranhas are a little bit tougher per the individual model, but have actually quite a lot of damage output rather than just guiding units. They get quite a lot of wounds for their cost at 55 points, move really fast and can move into the midfield early with the scout's 9 inches rule. And then from there they can do quite a big seeker missile alpha strike. You could have 6 shots at strength 14, AP3 and damage D6 plus 1 for 165 points. Very threatening and a good chance of taking out some enemy armour right off the bat there. Plus maybe following it up with fusion blasters maybe later in the game. They get quite a big melter for within 6 inch range if you can get them there. A bit unreliable wounding tough stuff with only strength 9, but if they do manage to sneak a wound through it's going to be kind of big. On top of all that they hand out some unturned battle shock as well. One enemy unit has to test at the end of the movement phase when they move past. It's only really got so much value in your own turn as it's mainly just going to be good for preventing enemies doing stratagems and things. For the right unit I suppose that could be kind of big though. Next up we've got Commander Shadow Sun for 140 points, one of the better synergy pieces in the Tau army once more, a nice aura of reroll ones to hit that'll help any Tau units out within range, whether it's really big stuff or more tame threats, again very nice for crisis suits, broadsides or even bigger things like hammerheads or storm surges or something. As well as that she also gives you a chance for farming command points as well, she's likely going to be in range of units that you'd want to use stratagems on most and if you do that then you farm a command point on a 5+. Besides that, her high energy fusion blasters are fairly strong anti-tank shots at 18 inch range with strength 10, so a bit of threat there, plus some small arms with a missile pod and flechette blaster. She's yet another thing that adds more lone operatives that the tower can field as well. Not too hard to kill if you can catch up with her despite the advanced guardian drone, but still quite disruptive, maybe buff the centre of your army for a turn or two, then go forward to actually deal some damage herself. Out of the Crisis Commander variants, I feel like the Cold Star Commander is probably the winner out of them in my opinion, or at least for a Crisis unit that's wanting to start on the board, maybe doing a bit of jump shoot jump shenanigans. He's 125 points and can again pack four different weapon systems, perhaps swapping one out for a shield generator if he wants to, and he could take the high output burst cannon with him too. I think that does compete at least fairly nicely with one psychic iron blaster, a whole bunch of spam strength 5 shots. He makes Crisis Suits super speedy with a 12 inch movement at base and he gives their weapons the assault keyword which is really quite nice with the auto 6 inch advance rule that they get at base. Advancing is far more useful if they don't just give up all their damage output. It means they could be moving 18 inches to gain some lines of sight, blasting the enemy and maybe spending that 2 command points to try and get a bit more safe. Definitely a model that helps you get the jump on the opponent as opposed to the other way around. Finally, last and perhaps least for tier 1 here, I feel like the Cadre Fireblade is perhaps a bit more borderline and maybe could have been an upper tier 2 choice perhaps. 50 points for a model that's a maybe upgrade for Breachers, plus 1 attack to ranged weapons, so it would turn the Breacher Pulse Blasters into 3 attacks rather than 2. I think if you're just trying to cram absolute maximal threat into a Devilfish, he's okay enough to use there. Chips him with a little bit of his own firepower as well. I think if I were using strike squads in the backfield, my first choice would probably be the ethereal, unless you were playing Farsight. Overall seems usable enough. To be honest, in hindsight, maybe tier 2 might still have been better for him at 50 points. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed a quick breakdown of Tau units in Warhammer 40k, and roughly how I'd rate them shaping up in 10th edition so far. Let me know your thoughts on the list, and which units you've been having most success with in the Tau army, and if there's any units here that you'd rank a bit higher or lower. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. And finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming, they do take a long time and a fair amount of effort to make. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys 
next time.